Sure. Yeah, let's begin. So thank you everyone for being here online. Um, I want to welcome you to the first part of our webinar series, the, uh, the webinar series for the Modeling Collaboratory for Subduction Zone Science, RCN. Uh, this is kind of an experimental format that we're going to work with, and um, we're so glad you could join us for this. We are going, this, this webinar series is going to focus on not just the science, but on the process behind successful collaborations um, relating to earth science uh, and some focus on subduction zones, although maybe a little less so in this case. But um, this one will be about an hour in total. Our speakers, Torsten Becker and Lapo Boski will present slides and uh, they will be moderated in discussion by Steve Grant, who was very nice to join us. We will go for about an hour here and then we'll wrap up. And at the end, uh, all of this will be um, recorded and stored online. We'll put up the slides and we'll try to put up the actual video of the webinar as well. So without further ado, I'll hand it over to Torsten and Lapo. Yeah, thanks a lot, Gabe. Um, I'll actually have to run uh, at 11 my time sharp for teaching. So hopefully we can be a little bit quicker than that and get some questions from the audience. Thanks everybody for joining. I just checked the participant list, a bunch of old friends and colleagues on there and some new faces. So this is great. As Gabe said, we have this modeling collaboratory for subduction RCM and uh, we thought we'd discuss some collaborations and, and how, how they came about and what the challenges are. And so we hope to do that here for seismic tomography and mantle dynamics, which is what LAPO and I have worked on together. Uh, I'm not really sure if this is a successful collaboration by which metrics to measure this, but I certainly always had fun. It was great to work with LAPO on this. And sort of, um, uh, let me see here. Uh, I guess it's useful to think a little bit in historical context. So while LAPO and I were both grad students at Harvard, uh, one of the most influential papers of the last 20 years came out, which is funnily enough, uh, has Steve, who's our moderator today, um, as, um, as the lead author. And I didn't select it because of Steve, to be polite, but it, because it really made the case at the time that when you look at uh, P-wave tomography, global velocity anomalies shown from uh, Rob Wanderhill's work on the, on the left-hand side and uh, video on Toro, then the structure, at least um, around 1,300 kilometers or so in the mid-mantle, was very similar to the structure in S-wave tomography, and it looked like slabs going through the transition zone. So that really spurred a transition in our understanding of whole mantle convection and the thermochemical evolution of the mantle, which I think is still not complete. We're still asking some of the same questions, but it really looked like, um, you know, the mantle was indeed convecting as a whole, which poses all kinds of problems, not least as to the persistence of geochemical reservoirs. And uh, my angle to that personally came out of the, the sort of school that was more or less started by Brad Hager and Rick O'Connell, who was my advisor. Um, also, of course, including lots of work by others like Alex Forte, Yannick Ricard, and many more. But the idea that you couldn't just sort of generally link plate tectonics to mantle convection, but you could take structure from seismic tomography, interpret it as density, and then drive mantle flow models. And here's an example from Brad Hager's work using very early tomography, showing that if you compute the, um, the geoid, then the geoid deflection that is predicted by these models based on tomography matches what is seen. And that was interesting. And so um, in that context, we can use tomography uh, to, to dry flow um, and we can understand what's happening in the mantle. There are now some specific questions. And some of these specifics include the origin of volcanism that is not found at subduction zones, but that's found not in subduction zones or ridges, but it's found in the interior of plates, so-called hotspot volcanism and, and, and the link to deep structures. So the general idea going back to, um, uh, you know, the sixties is of course that there are these hot plumes, hot, hot upwellings, 
relatively stationary in mantle flow and they cause volcanism. And ideally you should see these plumes or maybe you shouldn't in seismic tomography. Um, and so Lapo and I worked a, worked a bunch on, on trying to understand these, um, these structures and, and, and what we might be able to say from a combination of geodynamics and seismic tomography. And um, I guess this is our last overview slide here. The, the kind of questions, um, you know, besides plumes that the seismologist is asked or that the, the geodynamicist asked, what are the length scales of heterogeneity? What is the, how do slabs make it through 660, right? Even if they go through in general, how long do they stall? What do they do at, in the transition zone? Um, is there a structural uh, discontinuity? Um, you know, some compositional layering, density layering, anywhere between the moho and the core mental boundary. And, and what about the plumes? And on the right, we have a classic paper by, um, uh, by Paul Tackley reviewing in terms of the geography of these primordial P reservoirs, um, sort of the state of, of affairs by the, at the time where Lapa and I were, were grad students. And, um, and I don't know, I guess some of these models we probably ruled out by now, but maybe we can come back to that. And some of them may be seeing a bit of a resurgence here. And so what, what we thought we'd do, and I'll, I'll hand it over to Lapo for a bit here, is we're going to discuss the papers that we worked on, and we're, we're going to highlight a little bit the scientific implications, but they're mostly about why we, we wrote them and, and what maybe lessons were, were learned for us in terms of you know, putting those papers together. So Lapo, you want to you wanna chime in here? Yes, can I add a couple things about the previous slides? Um, if, if you go back to the first one, I, I would like to add a couple things, uh, the one with the Steve's right. paper. So this is, uh, I think, it's the sort of, um, uh, endpoint in some way of a research that started in the 1980s um, until I would say until the 70s inclusive probably we had a, a, at that point I think we had or people that were doing earth sciences at the time had a clear view of what the um, average vertical profile of, of uh, the mechanical properties of the earth was uh, at that time, um, and I would like to cite, besides uh, Brad Hager, also my former advisor, Adam Javonsky, uh, and John Woodhouse as well. So these people in the early 80s started to um, use growing sets of travel time measurements from global um, uh, arrays of uh, stations that were measuring arrival times of P waves and S waves from big earthquakes um, to develop um, models of lateral velocity variations at all depths uh, in the mantle. And, uh, and what happened be between the early 80s and, and this uh, 1997 paper is that there are a lot of um, improvements both in data coverage uh, and all, like we, we were recording more stations, we were recording them digitally, measurements became more precise, and also in the techniques that were used to invert, like we say, those data and turn them into maps of seismic velocity in the Earth's mantle. And um, I think one of the merits, merits of the paper that we chose here to represent all this research is that uh, these authors were able to optimize uh, the way these, uh, by for that time, extremely large data sets were being used and these extremely large inverse problem were being solved to come to a level of resolution that was really um, extreme for that time. So you see that what, what you see here, I don't know if you can point to those features, Thorsten, um, on your screen, the, at, at 1300 kilometers depth, those two linear features that were very nicely discussed in those articles by Rob Vanderhist and, and Steve Grant, uh, that like Thorsten was saying, was, was saying, sorry, could be interpreted as some uh, entire plates that had subducted into the lower mantle while keeping 
uh, a coherent um, structure. So that, I, I just wanted to add on that because basically my whole uh, PhD thesis was revolving around um, this problem. Like what, how, how, to what extent could we trust those very sharp features? What did they really mean? Um, and so, you know, when you, when you look at these models, some of what Lapo said, we now more or less take for granted, right? But this was a, it was, this was a really high impact paper and the focus was very much on the agreement between these different approaches yes. for P and S wave speeds. But then if you look, for example, in the lowermost mantle, right? The P wave model shows us something really different from the S wave model. And the question at the time was like, why is that? And I think it's, it's fair to say, right, that you know, Rob Vanderhills at MIT and Adam Giwanski at Harvard and with us as Harvard students, we were sort of a little bit in opposite camps at the time where Adam's models were very long wavelength and, um, and perhaps sort of more robust in some sense, but the Vanderhills and Grand models showed for the first time that kind of resolution, as Lapo said, that allowed making inferences as to subduction. And, and Lapo and my paper really came out of the, the desire to try to see, well, how different and how similar are these papers? Yes. And are these models? And, and that, again, seems like, a, seems like a sort of straightforward thing. But at the time, it, it wasn't, no one had done a formal comparison. And so what Lapo and I did is we got together and you can see here that, um, you know, this paper didn't involve any of our advisors and we just felt that it was our thing. And we took all these models and we compared them. And it turns out, you know, at the long wavelengths, as you might expect, they are actually not that dissimilar. And at the short wavelengths, they disagree. And then you can worry about what the reasons for that are. And we also did other stuff that we might come back later is we actually stacked models. And, and that's something that I think is both super useful, but also sort of still to this day kind of controversial if you can do that. And I mean, one of the things I remember, Lapo, you telling me at the time was that Adam was, was not particularly happy with you getting engaged with the geodynamicist, I guess, in the first place and, and writing that paper. Is that just my recollection? Yeah, I think so. <laughs> I don't know. I don't remember that. Uh, I don't remember these. Um, I, that my recollection is that I, um, I, I felt that, that um, my thesis maybe was a little bit too theoretical. Uh, maybe, I don't know. I guess, I guess part of the problem was that, um, like you said, there were several people at the time um, between Harvard and MIT also that were um, on different camps. Yeah. And, and I think Adam at the time, he, besides the, um, the, 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 the um, technical basis of the models that was different because um, uh, there were like these two school of thoughts, you know, uh, spherical harmonics people and block people, uh, sparse inversions where you represent structure with uh, pixels, okay, with uh, local basis functions and, and, and global smooth models where everything is expressed in spherical harmonics. These are technical things. So if I don't know, um, probably a lot of students, I hope, are listening to us. So things might be more, more or less straightforward depending on your background. But the point is basically is that we were sort of beginning to agree on, the, on what we call the large scale, the smooth, the global pattern of the models, okay? Like kratons are fast and um, and um, uh, the super plumes are very large and so on and so forth. But then when it comes to things like slabs that are very narrow and, and, and plumes that are just small conduits, we could not agree basically. Different models were showing very different things. So there was this aspect, okay, that, that you mentioned. But also I think that there, there was this big discussion when I, at the time when I was defending my thesis, which was for me was a bit abstract on whether the slab were these slabs were penetrating. The, this is the language that was used at the time, that was used at the time across the six the six sixty discontinuity or not. And I think 
that um, that Javonsky and and some of his co-workers, including in a way me, uh, because we worked together, we sort of ended up pushing a little bit the idea that maybe um, somehow these structures were not really continuous. Uh, and, and I think that, that if there was some unhappiness, like you say, uh, maybe Adam, like, somehow, he, he was just not convinced by um, this idea that of, of subpenetration, and, and he wanted me perhaps to be more conservative. Uh, I don't know, but yeah. it's difficult the way, the about things here. like 20 years or more. By the way, the figure we're showing here is a, is a plot of correlation of a forward model where slabs should be by, Dern by Bernard Steinberger with where fast anomalies are in seismic tomography. And the blue line shows that, you know, there is a positive correlation, but it's not that terrific. And we're sort of stuck uh, a little bit there as well in terms of when we look at, at the best, right, 20 years later, the best forward models of subduction, the match is still um, very much limited to the lower degrees. Um, I guess, sort of thinking about this paper, one thing that I really um, cherished from the time was taking a class from Adam Jivonsky where you, Lapo, were, I think, the teaching assistant. And it was kind of the craziest class I ever took because it involved like three of us in class. I think Bogdan Kustowski, Miyaki Ishii, and myself, and Adam telling his assistant to photocopy textbooks basically for every week. And so every week we were supposed to read a textbook on wavelets, linear inverse theory, nonlinear inverse theory. And then we would just sit down in a sort of salon kind of atmosphere and, uh, and discuss stuff, right? And pretend to have read the whole textbook over the weekend. And, and, and Adam was just sort of shooting the shit. And I thought it was very insightful. It was one of the best classes I ever took. And I felt like I got a lot out of it. And I think what um, what I really liked was that uh, there was a hands-on exercise, which I think you let Lapo, in terms of having us all invert face velocity um, measurements for 2D maps. And I thought that was really good to get a handle on things like parameterization, roughness, damping, and stuff like that. So I thought it was there was a great class, and and I thought. Um, you know, Adam, it was, it was a nice, nice class that was being taught. It was another similar one, sort of sweeping salon on continental tectonics I took with Paul Hoffman. And that was also just really thrilling. But I remember that was a cool class. And I guess we were lucky that there were, you know, there was a great student to teacher ratio, right? Do you remember that class? Yes, more or less. Yeah. <laughs> I thought you had read all the textbooks, actually. Now you're saying that you pretend that it's, I'm, I'm a bit. But anyway, so um, why don't you go two slides? You, you, can you skip the next two slides? Because yeah. the next one, yeah, next one. We'll go back to the next one. One more. Yes. So I, I'm thinking, no, one earlier. Yes. So, I, 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 sorry. Um, I thought maybe since we started talking now we've been talking now about continuity uh, and correlation between models uh, here we did a very similar thing so in in the previous slides you what you what Thorsten was showing you was a correlation with a subduction model in this later paper we try to do a correlation with a plume model so again the uh, geodynamics model com comes from Bernard Steinberger and um, and what we did was um, to to make a long story short to simplify a little bit. Basically, we we turned that dynamic model of where based on geodynamics considerations and and what we knew about the um, background structure of the Earth, uh, a model of where plume conduits would be, and we compared it, computing a correlation with tomographic model, models of seismic velocities. And, and what you see again is that it's not, mm, it's not so easy to get a definite answer. Um, you see, uh, mm, I don't know how much we should get into the details. What, what you see here 
are each panel is a different tomography model. So we might as well focus on the first one, the one on which uh, Torsten's pointer uh, is is uh, pointing at right now. Uh, it's model S mean that was based on an average of different S velocity models. And what you see here uh, is basically that um, if, if you look at the red curve, which if I remember correctly, is basically what at the time we consider to be the most realistic uh, model of plumes that Bernard could come up with. Right. There is a correlation which could actually be considered statistically significant. Uh, the Gaussian, if I remember, the, the histograms show the correlations that you get, how they're distributed if you just correlate with a whole lot of random plume models. So that was a way to say, okay, if uh, there was no structure, if we really knew nothing and everything or our ideas were, were wrong, uh, that's what we would get. So we would get some kind of small correlation perhaps, but uh, not very high. Uh, the correlation that we get if we try to do things properly is the red curve and it's still low. I mean, you see it's, it's 0 0.4. So a priori you would say, well, doesn't that, that it's very low. I mean, it doesn't mean anything, but still it's definitely statistically significant. It's actually it better mean, than the correlation with plumes, uh, with slabs. That's the, that's the thing that's been bugging me ever since, right? If you look at the numbers, then the mm -hmm. math with slabs in the lower mantle would be worse than that. Not much you mean worse. figure Slab. that you've shown before? Pardon me? You're talking about the figure that you've shown before, right? Pretty much, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So the, the, I, I don't remember, the values are a bit lower there, yes. Yeah. Um, then, so I think that the, the next paper may be that... Let me, let, let's just stick with this for a second because yeah. it's kind of interesting. I mean, as Lapo says, right, this red curve shows correlation if Bernhard is computing moving plume conduits, right, which is, of course, Bernhard's, one of Bernhard's biggest contribution. And you also, you also may wonder, right, what, what did I do in this whole thing? And I can't remember, but certainly not much. And the blue line, that's what happens when you go straight down from hotspots, right? If the hotspots were truly vertical, then the correlation looks pretty crummy. And, and that, that line that has the, the Gaussians for the random distribution, that's shifted with toward the negative correlations in the lower mantle. And that's because when you have downwellings, right, then the, the regions outside the cold slabs are anyway already seismically slower and it's correcting for that bias that even if there were no plumes and there was no relationship between hotspot and plumes you would still get an artificially negative correlation and that's what this is correcting for and what is kind of interesting is that we first wrote one paper here um, um, called dynamic models and seismic images where we we, we did this whole thing and we looked at the locations where plumes should be according to Bernard's models and we came up with this ranking of which hotspot actually has a deep source and which hotspot might be relatively shallow, right? And we can maybe come back to Yellowstone later. And so after this paper, we got a lot of flack from Don Anderson. And Don Anderson was like, oh, you guys, you know, you're stupid. You're, you're not accounting for this, this effect that I just described that, that slabs will be pushing things um, toward the regions that are seismically slow. And so this paper, right, is basically an answer to Don Anderson, right, which, you know, it was, and so this is because Don was like, oh, if you look at ridges, right, ridges have a strong correlation. It's not true, right? The ridges have a strong correlation with structure down to 400 kilometers, and you might worry about that, right? It might be too deep, and this is telling you about smearing and tomography, but they don't, they're not correlated in the deep mantle, but the locations where Bernhard infers plume conduits to be are. And that's kind of interesting, which, you know, I think at the time made me happy because, I mean, I'm not much, I don't care much about being right or wrong, but, you know, Anderson seemed to have good arguments. I was like, yeah, maybe we are stupid, and no, actually it works out quite nicely you know, at sort of the 99.99% level. 
which sort of um, was nice, but which also reminds me that when Lapo and I worked on this tomography comparison paper, one of our points was that, yeah, slabs go through 660 and there is some coherence. And I think the first time that paper was cited was by Don Anderson arguing the exact opposite, right? So I remember going like, yes, Anderson cites me. No, it's the exact opposite. So that was interesting, right? And um, so I guess this sort of moving plume business is still very much of interest in terms of trying to figure out where geochemical signatures come from, stuff like that. So Lapu, you want to move on to a different paper? Yeah, so maybe, I'm sorry, I'm changing the order a little bit, but see, given the turn that the discussion took, maybe I would go to slide number 15. Okay. Which because is... we sort of insist on, on the same idea. This is a very complicated figure, to be honest. In fact, I this... think it's a paper that has never been cited. I think it's quite, quite difficult, but I think we achieved this. Uh, I think maybe it's been cited once in 10 years. Um, but anyway, it's a good my paper. Papers, and it yeah, indeed and compared is to the one... others. I mean, I would say it's not worse than, than the others. So <laughs> I might as well talk about it. <laughs> so here, what, so I'm not sure if I can make it easy, but what, what we are doing basically, it's kind of a um, funny exercise. Uh, in, in, when you do seismic tomography, a lot of what you see as a result, unfortunately, depends on two things, on how you parameterize your model. Like we were saying earlier, in the old days, some people believed only in spherical harmonics, some other people believed in splines, some other people believed in pixels. Um, so the functions that you use to represent your image, okay? Uh, the image that, the map that, that you're gonna get. And another uh, factor which is very closely related to the first one is uh, regularization. That is, we have to solve an inverse problem that is very unstable, okay? So if you just feed it to your, uh, inversion routines, it will just crash. And you have to add some additional knowledge about the values that you, your parameters might take uh, if you are to get some sort of results. So what we did here in this paper was to test a whole bunch of, um, we, we used one parameterization. So we tried to use very small pixels and, and very tiny layers, most of all vertically. And then we tried a lot of regularization. And, and what we did in each inversion that we did, we would just allow a certain depth range in our mm, model to be non-smooth. Basically, we asked globally the model to be vertically smooth, which is a reasonable criterion that most global tomographers in the past would tend to apply. Uh, you don't want your velocity values to jump back and forth as, as you go vertically through your model. Uh, but then we would actually allow for that within just one depth range, okay? And so in all these figures that you see, we can just start with uh, the, the, top, to the top left one, just to explain what we mean. Uh, each value that you see plotted, whether in red or black, uh, represent how well we fit the data if we basically relax our constraint at that particular depth. If we let our model be discontinuous at, uh, in this case, uh, about uh, 1,200 kilometers, like right where Thorsten's um, pointer is pointing, we get a very good uh, um, variance reduction. Now, careful, the first two um, images, the first two plots to the left are not real data. Those are synthetic models. And we um, had put some uh, uh, discontinuities in the models that we used to create this synthetic data precisely at those depths where you see those uh, very big peaks. So the, f the first two plots to the right, to the left, show that basically our idea is not completely crazy. Uh, if in, in the model there were some major jumps at those depths, our exercise would 
give us a very big peak at, the, at those places. Uh, so let me jump uh, figure C and D and go directly, which is another form of synthetic test, and go directly to what happens. No one is citing this paper. Huh? <laughs> yeah, I know, I know, but still. Uh, you, you'll give your explanation afterwards. Uh, maybe, maybe it will go through eventually. And so what you see to the right, especially in, in the panel E, um, is that indeed the one place in, when, you, when you invert real data, when you apply this exercise to real data, where you have a major peak is the transition zone. Um, so if there is a place, uh, I, I don't know if, it, if I can put it that way, but if there is a place in the earth uh, where the pattern of convection has some kind of uh, change, it looks like it's precisely the subduction zone. But I, I would like to hear also Torsten's explanation because I yeah, think I would probably be I was drifting off there a little because we, again, you know, we're trying to do a lot of things. We're trying to be really good about the resolution and we're trying to be cautious here, which of course every scientist should, but I think we sometimes are on the side of being a little bit too confusing. And so, uh, I mean, Lapa, what you said is of course correct, but what this, what this red curve, just focusing on the red curve that my pointer is at right now, is saying is that if you take data and you run it in a version and you say that there's a break in the structure with depth at a certain depth, then where does that break make the most sense? Where does the data, the, ex, the explanatory power of the model increase the most if you allow for a vertical break? And as Lapo says, the answer is in the transition zone. But interestingly, it's a little bit deeper than 660. It's more like 800 or 1,000 kilometers or so. And so, of course, this jives with a number of geodynamic things like the suggestion that there's a viscosity increase in the lower mantle. There's a phase transition where the Clapeyron slope effectively, we still don't know, might be small, might be negative. And, and then the question that's come up more recently again is that where that, does that viscosity increase? Is it at 660? Is it at 1000? Is there a smooth transition? And here's a way to ask the data where the data wants to see a break. Right? And so again, this is a little bit historical because there is a series of models that originated at Harvard where there's a break in the parameterization between the upper and the lower mantle, where there's basically no damping, no vertical smoothing across the 660. And, and these models, um, you know, they, they, they are very good models. They are still around. And sometimes people look at these models and they go like, oh, there's a break at 660. But yeah, there's a break because it, it, this is a good place for the data, for the inversion to dump structure because it's not smooth, it's not regularized. And this was an attempt to see, well, how justified is this and what happens when you, when you, you know, break that assumption and you, you let it move around and that's the answer. And um, I guess sort of on a more serious note, right? I think the paper, um, didn't provide very much of a smoking gun, right? Because you can argue if it's significant, if this thing is below 660 or not in different data sets, for instance, this black data set, whatever that is, puts that break exactly at 660. The blue data set and the, and the yellow data set puts it below. So overall, right, there's a tendency of seismology to see a break further down into the lower mantle, but it's not that strong, right? It's a subtle thing. But, you know, as Lapa says, I think this is some of the best work we've, we've done together and no one cares. <laughs> Let me uh, jump in and ask a question. If there is a break in the tomography models, that's seismology, what does that mean geodynamically? I mean, can you model that break? Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, we've, people have revisited that. Um, you know, there was work by Peter Puster and, and Tom Jordan a long time ago running cylindrical convection computations and exploring the kinds of contributions and what is typically discussed are changes in viscosity and the, the copper slope of the 660 transition for olivine. If you have these ingredients, how do things change? And in a way that this was quantified 
um, empirically after the fact is by radial correlation functions, right? And so you can compute radial correlation functions. Uh, Paul Tackley did that and, 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 and Tom was pushing for that. And then you can, you can analyze it and, you know, you get a break in, in the spectral character. So I guess either of, of the viscosity increase um, or the phase change can, can do it. Max Rudolph revisited this in light of the new Berkeley models right fairly recently and his global convection computations reproduce this, um, this sort of signature broadly speaking. But I think it's still an open question if you need both, right? What, one, one thing I've been worrying about since I was a student is, is this increase in viscosity that we think is there, even though we don't know precisely where it is, sufficient to explain the general slab morphology? And there's, there's work saying that, um, that it's not, right? That you might need a little bit of a negative Klaproth slope. Um, but I think, uh, you know, it's very worthwhile to try to do this a little bit more quantitatively. And, um, uh, and I'm, I'm a big believer of, of having seismological inversions be driven by the kinds of hypotheses we are, we're trying to test, right? So mm -hmm. I, you know, I love it, like the stuff that uh, Mike Ritzwaller did, for example, where he parameterized the velocity of the uppermost mantle in terms of a seafloor age, right? We know that if it's half space cooling, there should be an error function. So why don't we use age as a single parameter rather than the depth dependence of seismic velocity that I really don't care about, but I care about the seafloor age. And here, right, um, you know, we're saying, well, where, where is there a break? And so let's, let's have that come out of the um, inversion, sort of like a trans-dimensional kind of thing, right, if you want, where we're asking, well, at least what's the depth of that uh, thing rather than imposing it. Did that even get to, to your question at all? Oh, that's fine. Um... I guess I'm not doing much as a moderator. We're, we're getting pretty late. <laughs> Why don't we move on to yeah. some slides? Lapo, is there, is there a specific thing you, you want to pick? I propose that we conclude with slide number 18. Which is, can you tell me? I have the numbers here. That's, that's it. Okay. Um, yeah. So there's a lot of things to say about this slide, but yeah, let me just say what I think could be perhaps uh, interesting, important. Um, so what you see here, yeah, this is re relatively recent, 2014, I think. Um, and what you see here are four different tomographic models of S velocity, which were the state of the art a few years ago, and more or less are probably still similar to the state of the art. Uh, the names of the model are written at the top. So four different groups, people working with different methods, you know, we talked about parameterization, regularization, also S wave, but different types of data, surface waves, body waves, multiple reflection, uh, overtones, and so on and so forth. Um, I guess the point that, that I would probably, uh, the first point that I would like to make if, is that if you compare that with Steve's work from over 20 years ago, I, won't, I wouldn't say that things have changed that much. If, you, if I think about when I started my PhD in um, the 90s, uh, at the time, things were changing quite fast because like I was saying, we moved. Also from a technological point of view, we had like people in the 80s would have some hundreds of observations and some hundreds uh, numbers, hundred few hundred free parameters to uh, describe the models. In the mid nineties, we were able to work with thousands and thousands of data and parameters. Uh, now, technologically, we are still growing. Uh, computers are becoming more powerful still, but the picture of the earth, of the, of the mantle of the earth that we have, I think tends to stay constant. Uh, that's the first point I would like to make. The second point I would like to make is that uh, there is a good agreement between these models. Like if you think on the other hand, at the discussions that we had uh, 20 years ago, uh, where people would disagree on pretty fundamental things like those uh, linear features at 1,000, 1,500 kilometers depth. Now, 
most authors would agree that those features, whatever their meaning, do exist. Okay, just compare those those four um, slices in in, uh, in in the map that you see in this on the screen at thirteen fifty kilometer depth. Uh, so I think that the situation now in global tomography, if I can say that, is that. Um, I, I guess to, to make it really, that would be sort of my, my main conclusion is that unless we uh, put instruments in places where we don't really have them, which means the oceans, which means two thirds of the surface of the earth, I doubt that even with the methodological and technological um, progress that we are having, uh, I doubt, it doesn't look like the that we are going to learn anything new about the earth yeah let's let's return to this in a second i guess i i'd like to know that i i care very much about this model because it's the first tomographic model that i was very closely involved with in terms of its development and you know i i spent a lot of time plugging other people's models into my flow models and then doing stuff with them and it was nice to to be involved in sort of building our own. And I think eventually this is sort of, if you have specific questions, to some extent what you have to do. Now this model has, has two features that you can't really see from these maps. Is one is it's radially anisotropic and I care a lot about anisotropy and, and as others, including Barbara Romanovitz have pointed out, it's really important to understand SH compared to SV if you're thinking about the depth of cratons and so on and it's related to flow. So that's nice. It has this feature. And it also has a feature where it, the model has uh, largely variable resolution, something that BOR and Spuckman did for P-wave models a long time ago. But um, this gives us a chance to do things like take U US array uh, data or you know now ALP array data and have regionally high resolution. And this is something like in a global model. This is something I'm still working on with my postdoc. Um, former postdoc Rob Hart and LAPO. Um, and so, so that's, that's nice. And I think it's really important to have this capability if you're asking questions such as the origin of dynamic topography. But what is also sort of a little bit odd is that, you know, when you, when you look at this model and you compare its explanatory power as quantified here in terms of matching the geoid, playing some games, which we might come back later, it's actually terrible. So this model, even though it looks um, a whole lot like other global models in some respects, does a really poor job in terms of matching the geoid. And I don't understand actually why that is. And so that is that is interesting. And I think as Lapo said, you know, there is um there is convergence in terms of global models, but there's still a huge questions remaining such as you know why is this model so different and is it because of radial anisotropy well uh, this particular model here by, by French Romanovitz has radial anisotropy as well does much better than other models and it's also kind of a question as to do we really see convergence uh, between the the models and this is what what this plot is showing that's another thing that um that Ludwig put together, and maybe we can open it up for questions and discussions after that. And it shows something like a boxcar average, time average of agreement between different S-wave tomography models in orange here. And that is showing you that there's certainly not, not a continuous trend toward more and more agreement. There's actually sort of times of setback sometime around 2002, I guess when Lapa and I were grad students, maybe we're to blame here. And then there's a recovery, right? And of course, it's it's not a it's not a scientifically rigorous plot, but it's trying to make sort of informed choices as to which models to compare with each other. And what you're seeing down here are radially anisotropic anomalies, and they are, of course, as we all know, much less in agreement between the models. And I think that is a, that that remains a challenge, right? And and we we know why that is, you know, harder. To measure love waves than rally waves, but and, and so on, right? Um, but I think if we if we are to make progress, getting the radial and our to be right, not just in terms of its one-dimensional average, but also its pattern is going to be important. And I think one of the 
one of the exciting things is you know this model by <coughs> by Ludwig that these interesting interest uh, differences as had you know Mark Panning's work earlier in terms of how the large low shear wave velocity provinces look in terms of radial anisotropy and if the, those are really different you know the uh, African pile the Pacific pile then perhaps this is telling us something about the origin and how these how these things got there so Lapo, you want to discuss any, any of this other stuff specifically, or maybe we can open up to questions and other discussion in Steve's comments. Uh, no, I think it's better to, um, I mean, I think we covered most of the most important things. Um, yeah. I, 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 I we, think we were supposed we to end earlier than this. Um, huh? yep. Maybe I can add about these last figures. Um, you might want, I guess we, we might want to uh, explain that what 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 we did here, what Ludwig Auer did here, was uh, to take the models that were published on the liter in the literature every year, 1998, 1999, 2000, or every couple of years, and just um, translate them to the same grid, to the same uh, geographical description, and compute a correlation, measure how similar those coefficients were. And basically, what I would say uh, is that we would have expected that um, to see something that would be slowly growing with time. We would have expected that as more data become available and, and people improve their methods and we all learn to do the same thing better, we go towards a consensus. So the correlation grows, but that's not what we are observing. So it basically, to me, it just reinforces my earlier statement that we are in a plateau. I mean, this figure is basically showing it. It is a plateau. I mean, we continue to agree, disagree more or less on the same level. Maybe it's not the only way to visualize this thing. Maybe there are better ways to measure how similar our maps are, but let's I would say that then, you know, if you forget about this figure and go back and, and take a look at the literature in the last 20 years, I, I, I would bet that yeah, we would all come to similar conclusions. Relate, related to this, there's been a question from Angela, uh, one of the attendees, and she's asking if the data and new technologies are not likely to drive the seismic tomography development, what key factor could play a role in progress of tomography? Do you have any ideas, Lapo? Where do we go from here? It's a great question. Um, well, so I, I uh, personally, I, 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 I've heard, I've noticed some efforts uh, over the, also that lasted now quite long to develop some new um, instruments. Uh, in particular, Kusnole and Frederick Simons were I think they even, um, I know that they uh, even have some prototypes now that uh, they have been testing in the fields. Uh, autonomous robots that basically would float at some depths in the oceans and pick up compressional waves from earthquake that propagate from the solid earth into the water. So what I'm, what I'm trying to say, this is sort of a complicated example, but the point is that we have lots of instruments on the continents and, and we have US array. In Europe, we have Alpa Ray. Uh, countries like Italy, Japan, the US, where you have a lot of earthquakes, invest important uh, amounts of money to monitor their territory with a lot of stations. So on the continents, especially in, in, in uh, rich countries, we have a lot of instruments, but we have nothing in, in certain parts of the world that are, uh, less uh, easy to um, reach or that have less funds to invest in these things. So basically, but most of all, it, it's the oceans that are a problem. We don't have, I don't think we have a, like a reasonably cheap technology to measure seismic waves at, from the bottom of the ocean. So I would think that if someone came up with an efficient way to, this, to deploy uh, permanent of long term or long term arrays at the bottom of the oceans that would probably change um, the picture in, in, in global tomography. So to that summarize, data probably is the, the key, you think? 
to better images. Based on what I've seen in the last 20 years where people have invested a lot of efforts in uh, methods, in numerical methods, adjoint methods, uh, conjugate gradients, banana donuts. Uh, these are all very valuable studies, but given that in, in 20 years of, of this, we, have, we don't have like a new model, you know, I, I would expect like a new model, like, uh, like in 97, when you and Rob came up with your models, it made a bit of a splash. I mean, people started to think about the mantle, if I remember correctly, in, in a slightly different way. This didn't happen now with um, uh, the strategies that people have followed since then. So if I were to choose, you know, do you want to invest your time and your money in data or in uh, theory and methods? In this particular case, I would go for the data. Yeah, so, I mean, I, I, I guess I, I mostly agree, right? And, and there are the, the floating mermaids are, are, are great. Uh, we still have to see the improvement in the models, you know, at least regionally. I think there's some evidence that this is really promising. There are other things going on, like Pacific Array, something that Hitoshi Kawakatsu has talked about for a long time, and that is now happening in a sort of Japan-US collaboration with Jim Garrity, um, in the lead, I think, from the US side, where there is a bunch of coordinated um, OBS deployments. They're not permanent, they're um, temporary deployments on the Pacific seafloor. Uh, and we love the Pacific because it's a fairly straightforward oceanic plate and geodynamists think for the most part, they understand how an oceanic plate is made. And it turns out that when you look at detail, there's a lot of surprises and, and, and we don't really know how the petrological and um, sort of cooling history of, of a plate works out in the end, um, particularly when it comes to anisotropy. So yeah, the, the oceans are, of course, a big challenge. Um, but, but then on the other hand, right, you uh, relying on advanced inversion methods, uh, such as uh, a full waveform inversion, does seem to provide higher resolution models, including sort of the work by Steve and, and his postdoc Tao and others for East Asia. And there's a lot of structure that um, we weren't aware of before. And I see a bit of a challenge in the, in the sense that we have images, right? We have models of places, say, in Asia or underneath North America, thanks to EarthScope, where there's fairly robust structure mapped, but we don't have any idea what it means, right? We don't really expect all this complexity underneath the Eastern United States. And we're still sort of picking up the pieces. So we had this interesting sort of situation where globally there appears to be a plateau. And, and I guess I agree with Lapo, more data will probably make the biggest splash there. But regionally, there's a lot of structure which we haven't understood, right? And that is robust. And so it, it, it's one of those things, right? Where it really depends on the question you're asking. And I, I think, you know, we could do much more in terms of synthetics, right? Generating proper hypotheses tests, right? If you are interested is a mantle wedge hydrated or not? What are the kind of waves that you should be looking at? What are the kind of signatures? And we should be doing more there. And I guess that is a method kind of approach. Do we have other questions from the audience, Steve? Yeah. Yeah, so we just got a, a question from Jonathan and I, I lose the last name. I'm, I apologize for that. But um, he asks, uh, puzzling that you're getting poor fit to the geoid from these yeah. models. Given P and S for all locations in your model, why not frame the problem as a regression based upon tomographic features, skipping out assumptions on densities? Has this been tried? I'm not sure I quite understand that, but... Uh... Um, I, I think the question might be a little bit about um, doing a joint inversion um, and... and and, and exploring different ways of scaling velocity anomalies to density, perhaps. And so the answer to that is this has been tried by Alex Forte and collaborators, including our friend Steve Brand, the moderator. And I guess philosophically, there's sort of two different approaches, right? One is you're saying, well, I believe the seismic tomography, and I assume that there's a simple relationship between 
seismic velocity and density, which implicitly assumes that things are more or less homogeneous chemically, right? Which may may or may not be true in the mid mantle. Certainly not true in the old cratons, and well, most likely not true in the old cratons. Most likely not true in the LLSVPs. But let's say this is the case, and then you invert for the physics, right? Uh, the viscosity structure, for example. Or the other point of view is. You, you think you know the, the physics, you think you know the mechanics of plate tectonics, the viscosity structure, you have the seismic data, and then you, you, you use the geoid and the seismic data as a constraint to solve for something else, which would be compositional anomalies. Now, so I think both of these have been tried and, and you get different answers, right? And so when, when I showed earlier this, this kind of experiment here, um, that is playing around with with just one component here, and Lapo hasn't seen this, where I'm where the x-axis is changing for different models, um, the relative importance of fast and slow anomalies, uh, because from a mineral physics perspective, you would think that the scaling is nonlinear, and the uh, slow anomalies should um, uh, contribute less in terms of the dense anomaly. And for most models, the fact that this blue curve bumps to the side reflects that. Uh, most likely, but um, I just sort of did this for fun and then plugging in Savani, um, it just gives you a very different answer for the geoid, which you wouldn't expect looking at the correlations. So there's something interestingly different in that model from the others. Maybe that gets to some aspects of the question. Yeah, I think so. Uh, let me ask you quickly, what do you think the key unknowns are? Where do we go from this in terms of the lower mantle uh, tomography and, and dynamics. What do we do? I mean, we, we've talked about an hour here. Tomography seems to be plateauing. That was one of the conclusions. Um, how do we make progress or do we understand everything? I love Don't say yes, otherwise I can't get funding. But, um, Lapa, well, what do you think? I think maybe we need uh, like from from maybe what we, i don't know like now i'm just you know i'm i'm i was just thinking aloud but i'm thinking maybe seeing this from the point of view of a uh, theoretician of wave propagation which basically am and i'm not unlike Tosten, i'm not that much of a geodynamicist but maybe from my point of view what i would like to understand better is besides mapping the structure of the earth okay but what specifically do we need to constrain like what we tried to do with the plumes i think was uh useful and and in a way also powerful i mean i think to me it, it did help me at least to come to some conclusions about what i understood of the earth because we knew what we were looking for and so rather than trying to just look at red and blue uh images and make some sense out of them which is a very difficult exercise and sometimes you end up, you know, there's a lot of wishful thinking while it's very subjective. If uh, we sort of reverse the problem and say, okay, it's very important if we want to understand the earth, like Adam Zhevonsky used to say uh, before he passed away, uh, he, he was insisting, and I think he was very right, uh, you have to understand the degree too. Uh, why is the earth dominated by a uh, degree two structure. I'm just, you know, I'm just shooting this idea. You know this issue better than me, Torsten, but what I'm trying to say is, um, can we maybe decide uh, what it is that we need to focus on? Uh, and then maybe rather, like I said, rather than just coming up with the next tomographic model that has banana donuts and that has a new parameterization, et cetera, since they all look the same, honestly, for the last 20 years, maybe devise a method designed to constrain some particular feature. Maybe instead of trying, you know, the brute force approach of inverting, in like 20 years ago, we were happy to invert 200,000 travel time arrivals. Now, two, two millions, maybe next year, 20 millions. Maybe let's just invert 10 observations, but just the right ones to constrain the feature that is important to us. 
Yeah, but, I, 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 I agree with that. And I think the, the power of full waveform computations seems to be not fully realized in the sense that LAPO just mentioned. I'm still waiting for someone to detect the wiggle of mental wedge hydration, right? Where we're sort of turning things around the way that Don Helmberger somehow seems to intuit to look at waveforms and then bring it to these, these questions that we really care about, right? And, and, and I, I do believe that efforts such as CIDR where you're not just learning to teach, to speak each other's language, but you're where you're trying to learn each other's tools to work in a disciplinary are important. And, and I do think there's a lot of progress that came out of that. And, you know, speaking of degree two, right? Adam attended one of the CIDR meetings and he sat me down and we spent an afternoon talking about degree two, which, you know, some of that involved about in two hours of Adam saying, oh, you should hold the piles fixed. And me saying, I can't think of a reason why they would be fixed. And so, uh, you know, sometimes you, you, you get stuck, but I think working in a disciplinary and, and, and uh, doing hypothesis testing based on the full waveforms will bring us forward, which is a method kind of thing. So I guess we're sort of data and methods at the same time. I have to actually go teach. So I have to sign off. Perhaps you guys want to wrap it up the next couple of minutes, but I got to go. And um, I'd like to thank everybody uh, for you know listening to us here, and I hope this was uh, somewhat useful. And um, I'm gonna sign off. Okay. Okay. Thanks, Torsten. And I think this is a good time to cut it short. Uh, any final words from Lapo or Steve? I, I would ask if anybody has any quick question they want to at the end. I guess Lapo and I can try to uh, handle that. Um, yeah. So. I'll just give a little outro here, uh, and if any questions come up, we can address them. Also, feel free to email us after the fact. We'll be very responsive. Um, so uh, I just want to give a quick announcement about our next webinar in the series. That's going to be on March 4th. It's going to be between Andy Freed, Greg Hirth, with uh, Mark Bain as a moderator. Uh, we also have another one on March 17th. So check your emails for that. Um, I don't see any more questions from the audience. So I want to, again, thank Steve Lapo and Torsten, who's gone at this point, for, for being here and speaking. And I think we'll wrap it up. Thank you very much. It was, uh, it was a lot of fun. Great. Thanks. Bye-bye. Yep.